he was the most successful anti-submarine commander of World War II. He was the recipient of the DSO and an unprecedented three bars. He's ranked by some naval historians as one of Britain's greatest naval fighting commanders. The mere fact that there is today a statue of Frederick John Walker in Liverpool will have surprised nobody more than Captain Walker himself. Known universally as Johnny Walker, he was the most successful anti-submarine warfare commander of the Battle of the Atlantic. Using U-boat hunting techniques largely devised by himself, and creating tactics that Admiral Sir Max Horton introduced to the Western Approaches fleet, Walker was responsible for the sinking of more U-boats in the Atlantic than any other British or Allied commander. His remarkable exploits have since drawn comparisons with some of the greatest naval commanders of all time, and he has frequently been described as Britain's greatest fighting sailor since Horatio Nelson. When war broke out in 1939, Johnny Walker's 30-year-old naval career seemed to have reached a dead end. Although he had latterly been given command of the aging First World War destroyer, HMS Sakari, he continued to be passed over for promotion and had instead been scheduled for imminent retirement. However, he gained a reprieve due to the outbreak of war and by January 1940 had been given the job as the operations staff officer to Vice Admiral Sir Bertrand Ramsey at Dover. As such, he played a fundamentally important role in the evacuation of the British Army from Dunkirk, from which he was mentioned in dispatches. His lack of promotion had, in part, been seen as a consequence of him specialising in anti-submarine warfare during the interwar years. Consequently, he spent years serving as a fleet anti-submarine officer, a job that gave him little prospect of promotion. Additionally, many senior naval commanders saw anti-submarine warfare as a somewhat unfashionable job within the Royal Navy. By the summer of 1940, with German U-boats now based along the French coast, there was a growing and serious U-boat threat to British merchant shipping in the Atlantic. But it took until October 1941 for Royal Navy commanders to post one of their own specialists to anti-submarine duties. That month, still with just the rank of commander, he was put in charge of the 36th Escort Group, which was to operate from the new Western Approaches base in Liverpool, following its move from Plymouth. His task was to escort and protect merchant ships from U-boats and other German raiders between Britain and North America, or between Britain and Gibraltar. The 36th Escort Group consisted of two Royal Navy sloops, HMS Stork, which Walker commanded, and HMS Deptford, plus seven Royal Navy corvettes. As the commander of this group, Walker quickly demonstrated his unconventional yet successful methods of dealing with U-boats. Although ordered to, first and foremost, simply escort the convoys, he believed, like so many great military commanders, that attack was the best form of defence. During his first mission in December 1941, he put this theory into practice by taking the attack to any U-boats with which they came into contact. His mission was to escort a group of 32 ships from Gibraltar to Britain. Sailing from Gibraltar, Walker's escort group had been joined there by the aircraft carrier HMS Audacity, a converted German merchantman, plus and three destroyers, HMS Exeter, Blankney and Stanley, the latter being a former United States First World War destroyer that had been renamed. Not long after leaving Gibraltar, the convoy was midway between Portugal and the Azores when a martlet plane from HMS Audacity spotted what they thought was a pack of about 12 U-boats. 
Walker ordered the three destroyers and one of his corvettes to break off and immediately attack. U-131 was soon located by HMS Stanley's sonar and she was quickly sunk by depth charges from the corvette. The next morning, HMS Stanley and HMS Blankney scored another success, sinking U-434. But HMS Stanley's luck was about to run out. While on the stern station of the convoy, she reported contact with a further U-boat. Half an hour later, a torpedo from U-574 scored a direct hit. HMS Stanley exploded and sank with the loss of all the 25 of her crew. Walker reacted immediately, putting HMS Stork at full speed. Within 12 minutes, he had reached the U-boat, rammed her and depth charged her as she sank. Shortly after this incident, HMS Audacity left the convoy with her escort, HMS Exeter and HMS Blankney, and headed back to Gibraltar. However, on her way, she was hit by a torpedo from another U-boat, and she sank. But under his care, Walker brought all but two of the 32 merchant ships safely back to Britain, having joined the voyage, destroyed five U-boats. At the time, this was considered an extraordinary feat, and Walker's voyage was proclaimed as a triumph, with many describing it as the first true Allied convoy victory of the war. For this, he was awarded his first DSO, with a citation saying, For daring, skill and determination while escorting to this country a valuable convoy in the face of relentless attacks from the enemy. As the commander of the 36th Escort Group, Walker went on to sink many more U-boats, leading to the ward of the first bar to his DSO in July 1942. During that year, Walker was at last promoted to the rank of captain. He left the 36th Escort Group and was posted to what is known as Captain D. Liverpool. This job gave him administrative responsibility for ships of the Royal Navy's western approaches. It also gave him time to recuperate from his exertions with the 36th Escort Group and it gave him an opportunity to make an innovative suggestion to the new commander of Western Approaches, Admiral Sir Max Horton. Walker believed that groups should be created that, rather than being merely convoy escorts, acted as reinforcements of convoys under attack. So rather than being restricted to merely convoy escort duties, they would have the task of actively hunting and destroying U-boats that tried to attack convoys. Horton liked the idea and gave him command of the 2nd Escort Support Group in 1943. One of five such groups would eventually be created by Admiral Horton. Walker's group consisted of six modern, fast, specially equipped sloops, with Walker commanding from HMS Starling a newly commissioned Black Swan class sloop. In June 1943, Walker's own ship, HMS Starling, was responsible for sinking two U-boats. The first, U-202, was destroyed on the 2nd of June by depth charges and gunfire, and the other, U-119, on the 24th of June by depth charges and ramming. Another U-boat, U-449, was sunk by his group on the same day. The following month, Walker's support group encountered three U-boats on the surface in the Bay of Biscay. Walker immediately opened fire at the U-boats, causing them damage which prevented them from being able to dive. He then made the famous naval signal, General Chase. His group immediately closed in on the U-boats, with two, U-462 and U-504, being sunk by his ships, and one, U-461, by an Australian flying boat. The signal General Chase is rarely used by the Royal Navy. Its purpose is to release ships from a line of battle to pursue a retreating or beaten enemy. In theory, this would normally occur at the end of an action, when victory is certain and it gives ships the ability to act independently in order to pursue at best speed the enemy with the aim of capturing or destroying their vessels. According to Royal Navy legend, this signal has only ever been used twice before once by Sir Francis Drake when he chased the Spanish Armada from the Channel in 1588, 
and once by Rear Admiral Horatio Nelson when he defeated Napoleon's fleet at the Battle of the Nile in 1798. To add to his growing charismatic legend, Walker adopted the practice when returning to base in Liverpool of having the tune, A Hunting We Will Go, playing over all the ship's tannoys. No doubt this was influenced by the custom that had now developed of British submarines flying the Jolly Roger when returning home after a successful mission. This had been practiced during the First World War by the then Lieutenant Commander Max Horton when returning home in his submarine HMS E9. Walker's return in August 1943 was not such a happy event as he learned of the loss of his son Timothy, who had been serving on the submarine HMS Parthian, which had recently been sunk in the Mediterranean. A month later, Walker was appointed a companion of the Order of the Bath for what was described as leadership and daring in command of HMS Starling in successful actions against enemy submarines in the Atlantic. More success followed. On the 6th of November 1943, Walker's escort support group sank U-226 and U-842. On the 31st of January 1944, they sank U-592. On the 9th of February, they sank U-762, U-38 and U-374, all in one action. And then they sank U-242 two days later, followed by U-264 a few days after that. This had all been achieved without any loss to his group. But a week afterwards, on the 20th of February, HMS Woodpecker was torpedoed and sunk while being towed home. Walker managed to rescue the entire crew and all personnel returned safely to Liverpool. Such had become the notoriety of his patrols at this time that A.V. Alexander, the First Lord of the Admiralty and the political head of the Navy, was there to greet him. Hip, hip, hip. Walker was awarded a second bar to his DSO. By now, Walker had perfected a number of techniques for destroying U-boats. One that he frequently employed was called the creeping attack. This addressed the problem. The ASDIC, or sonar, used to detect U-boats, work forward of the ship, while the depth charges were projected from the stern. Skillful U-boat commanders could therefore maneuver their boats away at just the moment when the hunting ship was itself maneuvering to bring the U-boat onto its stern rather than its bow. Contact was thus lost and the depth charges wasted. Walker ensured that his ships were well drilled and well practiced. He trained them to work in pairs. One would maintain contact with the U-boat where the other carried out the attack based on the U-boat's continued location being provided to them by the other. This tactic required practice. It was also expensive in time and resources, but was devastatingly effective. Walker's second escort support group became highly successful at this and even continued to use it after the introduction of the forward firing depth charges called the Hedgehog. A refinement of this tactic was the barrage or plaster attack in which three or more sloops in line would launch depth charges to saturate an area in a similar manner to a rolling barrage by artillery in advance of an infantry attack. Another highly successful tactic that he developed was called the hold down. This he used against U-boats that went deeper than the detonation range of depth charges. The maximum depth at which the Royal Navy's depth charges worked was 600 feet. The depth to which most U-boats could dive was set by the Kriegsmarine at 700 feet, but in practice, some U-boat commanders were known to take their boats down to 800 or even 850 feet in an attempt to avoid depth charges. While maintaining Aztec contact with such boats, Walker continuously circled above them until they ran out of air or battery and were forced to the surface, after which he would quickly destroy them with his ship's guns. In March 1944, Walker's group provided part of the 32-ship escort force for a Murmansk convoy of 49 merchant ships, codenamed Convoy JW-58. 
The powerful escort included two aircraft carriers and an escort of numerous destroyers. They were joined by the U.S. Navy light cruiser USS Milwaukee, which was on its way to Russia as part of the Lend-Lease program. The entire force was commanded by Rear Admiral Frederick Dalrymple Hamilton on the cruiser HMS Diadem. The Admiral initially ordered Walker's group to provide a tight screen for the convoy, but soon gave him independent command of both the support groups attached to the convoy. Soon Walker in HMS Starling had sunk U-961 and subsequently the ships under his command sunk U-360 and U-288 before the convoy arrived at Bermansk without a loss of a single ship. The convoy's return journey was equally successful, but not without incident when U-473 was encountered and sunk. Despite near total exhaustion from the constant battle with U-boats, in May 1944, Walker was given the immense task of providing protection from U-boats for the Normandy landings. For this task, he was given 40 ships under his command. As Allied troops landed on Normandy beaches, the German U-boat commander, Admiral Dunitz, ordered 76 U-boats to sail from their bases along the Bay of Biscay to attack the invasion fleet in the English Channel. Over the first three days, Walker fought no fewer than 36 attacks by U-boats, during which he sank eight U-boats, with many more severely damaged. He was assisted by Allied aircraft, who claimed a further six U-boats. After three days, the U-boats withdrew to replenish and regroup. They soon returned in a desperate effort to penetrate the English Channel. For a further two weeks, there was no rest for either men or ships. Walker was constantly in the thick of the action, adjusting tactics, laying new plans, all with seemingly inexhaustible energy. After three weeks, with hardly a U-boat penetrating his defences, the U-boats withdrew. They had suffered an unbelievable mauling in the battle and would never again return in strength. The wolf packs had been destroyed as an integrated fighting force. For this, Walker was awarded the third bar to his DSO and he was again mentioned in dispatches. Back home in Liverpool, Walker was being acclaimed in the press alongside such names as Eisenhower, Montgomery and Ramsey. The family received official news from the Admiralty that he was to be knighted. But the following day, on the 7th of July, Walker suffered a stroke and died two days later at the Naval Hospital in Seaforth on Merseyside. He was just 48 and died without ever receiving the knighthood that he had been promised. His death was attributed to exhaustion from the concerted effort that he made to safeguard the Normandy landings. Excessive strain, overwork, and war wariness had been brought on by his dedication to the total destruction of the enemy and in the service of the country. His funeral service at the Liverpool Anglican Cathedral with full naval honours was attended by 1,000 people. A naval procession followed with sailors escorting his body through the streets of the city to the docks where it was embarked upon the destroyer HMS Hesperus for burial at sea.